Hey everyone, <laughs> welcome back to Reading with Raptors. I am currently giving a mist bath to our guest for today. This is our, our resident Northern Harrier, who I do not believe we've actually featured on Reading with Raptors yet. So this is a bird who um, often gets very into baths in this way. Um, she usually has a water pan that usually doesn't, uh, usually doesn't usually use it very much. So usually spritzing like this, I figured we're doing something kind of new, so I figured I'd do something that she just seems to get a lot out of, usually. So we'll see if she kind of opens up those wings a little bit more, gets a little bit more into the bathing process here. I'm kind of keeping an eye on her via the screen here. Maybe we do this for a minute or two before we get to start reading. We can try my other hand here. So usually she'll kind of waddle around a little bit, stretch out those wings, do a little bit of preening, do a little bit of that kind of dunking motion that birds generally do when they are being either rained on or are dunking themselves into some water. So we'll see if she does any bit of that. Hopefully we'll get a little bit of preening and kind of bathing after this. So we'll see. Here's how we're kind of starting off our day. So this Northern Harrier, someone in the comments just said meadow. Um, we do call this bird meadow after the big open grasslands where we normally see northern harriers, right? Up here in Minnesota, it's a little too chilly for them this time of year. It's a little bit too cold. You can see those very, very long legs are really not conducive to staying warm here in Minnesota during this time of the year. But we'll see them throughout a lot of the state, especially in big open plains areas. Um, I'll actually usually see them I'm driving or are in the car or on the bus out in more kind of rural areas. I'll see them, there we go. We'll see them out in um, those big open grassy areas. I'll actually see them hunting on the side of the road in those big open ditches, especially on more kind of country roads. So you can find them throughout most of North America, in those big kind of open grassy areas. So normally they are using that very interesting shape of their face. You can see she almost has an owl-like facial disc um, something really typical of harriers. Harriers are a kind of hawk, um, most closely actually related. They're kind of a branch off of the accipiter group of hawks, which includes hawks like our Cooper's hawks or goss hawks or sharp shinned hawks, um, who are generally kind of very, very quick, agile, bird hunting raptors. But harriers are kind of a unique offshoot of that who are normally adapting to living in those big open grassy areas instead of the more forested areas that you see uh, most exhibitors or very kind of fast bird hunting hawks living in. So harriers as a big family group have this big kind of facial disc kind of shape that's actually doing the same thing it does in owls, funneling sound towards their ears, which are kind of little holes on the sides of their heads. Um, so a little bit different looking than most other hawks. They also have, um, this bird only weighs about a pound. Her actual body is pretty teeny tiny, but you can see when she spread out those wings, she has really long wings and very long legs. You actually might recognize uh, kind of similar features on our uh, barn owl and some of the times when we've seen her stretching out her legs and wings. Also a great plains, kind of big open grassland areas kind of bird. Same thing with our short-eared owls, another kind of worldwide open plains type of owl. So you see these big long wings, perfect for swooping low and kind of gliding over those grassland areas using their, both their eyesight and their hearing for hunting in those tall grasses. And then using those very long, narrow legs to reach through those grasses and grab onto small animals. So usually a lot of things like mice, very small rabbits, um, maybe the occasional kind of prairie bird, uh, maybe some big insects, but usually looking for those really small kind of mammals or other birds, um, the occasional snake and lizard living out in the open grasslands as well. Um, so that is what uh, Northern Harriers are all about. So again, kind of uh, unique right now, not really seeing any of them up here this far north this time of year. They're all further down in the southern parts of the U.S. Um, I will also say that this particular Northern Harrier um, is likely a female with a nice kind of brownish kind of coloring, great for camouflaging. These birds don't build nests in trees, they build them right on the ground. So camouflage is really important for both the first year juveniles and the females. The males tend to have this very kind of ghostly gray color, um, almost silver, really, really light. 
Um, so they're really, um, really stunning to see and really um, kind of show up really well when you're looking at them in those kind of big open grassy areas. So you might see a bird that has the big long wingspan, the long, long legs, that big facial disc looking shape. You might be looking at a male. They're that kind of grayish, almost silvery color. So really striking to look at. So with all of that kind of introduction, I wanted to give her a little bit of time to get used to me kind of talking and moving things around and get a little bit of a mist back in before we got started. But I found a book um, that I thought would work really, really well with our Northern Harrier. So this is a book called Plant a Pocket of Prairie. This is by Phyllis Root with illustrations by Betsy Bowen. Um, I thought a great time of year, I don't know about all of you, but I personally have been starting to already look forward to the springtime. I know we're just into January, but time to start thinking a little bit about if we're doing any sort of planting, might need to start planning out maybe some gardening space, maybe we've got window boxes. For me, I'm just even thinking about putting some herbs in my kitchen windows. I want to start thinking about kind of what I want to plant this next year. Um, so great time to start thinking about planting a pocket of prairie. So hopefully this is enjoyable for that. Here's the first page right away. Plant a pocket of prairie. I also love the illustrations in this book. Even this is the dedication page, so I won't read anything on this page, but you can see beautiful native kind of grassland plants. This particular book is actually pretty specific to Minnesota and kind of the upper Midwest. So it has a lot of great examples of our native prairie grassland kind of animals and plants. So once, oops, once, prairie stretched for thousands of miles, an ocean of flowers and grasses, a sea of sky, home to bison and elk, prairie chickens, burrowing owls, five lion skinks, plains garter snakes, and odo skipper butterflies. Here's this side page. I love the butterflies here on the O. But here's that prairie chicken and burrowing owl, a couple of reptiles. All the different kinds of these native grassland plants and animals. It's the whole page. Almost all gone now to farm and town and city, even before we knew all of the things a prairie could do. But if you want to see what a prairie might be, dot dot dot, there's a little meadow lark big open kind of farming fields with some kind of wind turbines up here little routes from our northern harrier so if you want to see what a prairie might be plant a pocket of prairie in your backyard or boulevard or boxes on a balcony if you plant a pocket of prairie who might come plant foxglove beard tongue a ruby-throated hummingbird might hover and sip and thrum. If that hummingbird sips and zips looking for something more to eat, here's a nice kind of porch area with some different plants planted around, that ruby-throated hummingbird. So if that hummingbird shows up, what else might be around? Plant butterfly weed. Monarch butterflies might lay their eggs on the undersides of leaves. And when those monarch eggs hatch and the larvae turn into hungry butterflies, I'll point out, here's this little lark who is looking at the seed that is now kind of sprouting. So those butterflies on that milkweed. Plant rough blazing star. Great spangled fritillaries might show up too. If monarchs and fritillaries aren't enough for you, plant asters. Silvery checker spot butterflies might lay their eggs on their leaves. So here are those different kinds of plants. Our little middle arc over here is watching this plant sprout up. I'll show you up close. Here are these beautiful illustrations. I actually have to look and see what what medium this is, because it's not quite watercolor. I'm not actually sure what it is, but I think it's gorgeous. Your pocket of prairie might be full of blooming and buzzing and fluttering, but don't stop now. Plant purple cone flowers and joe pie weed and wait for Dakota skippers and swallowtails to flit and feed. While you are waiting, 
so you can see that little nano lark watching this plant grow up. All the different kinds of butterflies and moths on these native flowers. So while we are waiting, plant goldenrod. A great plains toad might flick its tongue at goldenrod soldier beetles. Not enough prairie for you yet? Plant cup plants. A thirsty chickadee might come to drink from a tiny leaf pool. Here you can see that kind of balcony in the background and here are even more plants growing up in this little pocket of prairie. All lots of little critters zipping around. Plant big blue stem and Indian grass. Grasshoppers might eat the grass before grasshopper mice eat the grasshoppers. More prairie still. Here's that grasshopper mouse eating that grasshopper. Plant sunflowers and goldfinches might dine upside down. If you've ever seen a goldfinch trying to hang off of a sunflower, you know that kind of often tips them over. You'll see them hanging upside down trying to get those seeds out. What else can we plant in our little pocket of prairie here? Plant bottle, I think it's gentian, gentian? Somebody may have to correct my pronunciation, gentian. A bumblebee might battle inside, leaving only its bumblebee bottom sticking out. If your pocket of prairie grows big enough, plant prairie milkweed and hairy mountain mint and breathe sweet air. There's that bumblebee delving into that plant. Here are more plants, that milkweed and hairy mountain mint. A dick sisle might build a nest and lay four pale blue eggs. A prairie skink might guard her eggs beneath a rock. A meadowlark might fly calling chee 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 cheer. So here's that dick sisal down here with the eggs and also a prairie skink down below with their eggs. And here is that meadowlark singing. If your pocket of prairie grows bigger still, who else might come? Who knows? Here we have a very large bison and probably a little baby bison, young bison here. Who knows who might show up? If you plant a pocket of prairie, and I plant a pocket of prairie, and everyone we know plants a pocket of prairie, and everyone they know plants a pocket of prairie, one day we might look out and see the prairie coming home. Here's that nice big open kind of grassy area, that big sky behind it. All the different birds and insects flittering around. We know underneath these grasses are all those reptiles and other small animals. So another reason why I really enjoyed this book when I found it is that it has a lot of great information at the back. So we'll read through some of it. We won't read through every single part, but I really enjoyed this part it is very informative. Let me show you the close up of this map here before you read about it. This is a map of Minnesota. It shows you um, as of 1847. So obviously there was lots of prairie and lots of amazing habitat here in Minnesota before 1847, but this is probably one of the earliest states that we have specific um, scientific documented information about it. Obviously there is a very, very long history of people being here in Minnesota, um, doing a lot with the environment, but this is kind of the, the first I'll say recorded data that we have in our kind of systems is maybe how I'll word that. But here are the lakes in blue, the kind of former range of the prairie here in green. The kind of what it says other is oftentimes kind of forest areas, um, startups of towns, but usually a lot more up here, especially a lot of forested area. And then now here in red, those are the areas that as of 2011 has native prairie still remaining. So very, very diminished compared to its former range for sure. So let's read about it here, a little bit more information. 
Once, native prairies covered almost 40% of the United States. Wet prairie, black soil prairie, sand prairie, goat prairie, gravel prairie. These prairies were home to hundreds of kinds of plants and animals. When European settlers arrived, they plowed the rich prairie soil to plant crops. When prairie was too rocky or rugged to farm, cattle and sheep ate the grass. Less than 1% of that native prairie remains, making prairie one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. We can't bring back the prairie as it once was. The great seas of grass, sometimes taller than a person on horseback, with their web of soil, plants, and animals, are gone, along with the enormous herds of bison that lived on the prairie. Although we cannot bring back the original prairie, we can plant pockets of prairie. Even a little prairie still benefits the insects, birds, and other animals who are at home on the prairie and also preserves the beauty of prairie flowers and grasses. Prairie plants provide food and homes for butterflies, bees, dragonflies, and a host of other insects, as well as for the birds that eat the insects, the animals that nest in the grasses, and all sorts of prairie life. Especially important, native plants are food for native insects in the larval stage. Some plants feed the larvae of hundreds of different native insects. Without milkweed, for example, monarch, oh sorry, without milkweed for monarch larvae to eat, for example, there would be no monarch butterflies. Why do native insects matter? Without them, many of our native birds have no source of food. No plants, no insects, no birds, everything is connected. Every native prairie plant helps maintain the ecosystem. Who knows? Someday my backyard and your backyard and all the other backyards might make a new kind of prairie, a pocket work prairie, where wildlife can thrive. You might not look out your window and see a bison, but you might see monarchs and warblers and stayed foot toads. You will certainly see prairie grasses and flowers like the, one that the ones that used to grow as far as the eye could see to the edge of the sky and beyond. So how to plant a pocket of prairie? Be a prairie detective. Do research at the library or online and find out what kind of prairie might have grown in your area. Remember that different plants need different amounts of sunlight and water and space. Read in books or online or talk to people who know prairies to see what might grow best in your own pocket of prairie. Prairies have been called upside down forests because of the deep roots of many prairie plants. In a prairie, there is more biomass, or the total amount of living material, under the ground than above the ground. The deep roots of prairie plants help them survive drought and wind. Deep-rooted plants don't do well in boxes or pots, but some plants, such as bergamot, black-eyed susan, large-flowered beard tongue, purple coneflower, purple pr prairie clover, rattlesnake master, rough blazing star and spiderwort have shallower root systems and grow well in containers. Others like big blue stem and compass plant need to be planted in the earth so their roots can grow many feet deep. Buy prairie plants or seeds from a reputable nursery that grows its own prairie plants. Never ever dig up plants in the wild. The more kinds of plants in your prairie pocket, the more opportunities you are giving insects, birds, and other animals to find food and shelter. Be a prairie observer. Every week your pocket of prairie will change. Keep notes of what you plant, how it grows, when it blooms. Watch what comes to your pocket of prairie and write it down. If you don't recognize your visitors, find a guidebook or search online. A world of prairie life comes together when you plant a pocket of prairie seeds. Our little bird companion who's been with us for the whole book is apparently doing some of its own research. Here's actually a little diagram. It's really small on this one, but it mimics a lot of the diagrams that I have also seen of prairie grasses. So normally, so this is kind of set up so this is underground and this is above the ground. These are all native prairie grasses. You can see how deep these root systems get. A lot of the grasses that we see planted in people's yards barely get underneath the surface of the ground. 
You can actually, um, if you've ever seen kind of a row of sod, that's the whole system. That's the whole grass kind of root system, only stretching down a few inches compared to the multiple feet that a lot of our native prairie grasses and other plants grow their root systems down into. So this is helping to enrich huge amounts of dirt and soil. It's also helping to anchor these plants in rain and wind, so it prevents erosion and soil loss. So really important to have a lot of these grasses growing, a lot of these plants growing in areas. Here are a few of the plants and animals that were mentioned in the book. I'll see what we have time for. We might not be able to read about every single one, but I'll pick out a few of them, see what it says. So here is a close-up of the bison and the elk. So let's read a little bit about them. Prairies are rich in numerous flowers and grasses, many with wonderful names. Hundreds of kinds of animals, too, live in prairies, including many insects that survive only on native plants. Here are a few prairie dwellers. So here are our mammals that were mentioned in the book. There is the bison. I love this because it has the scientific name, which I'm always a fan of. So the scientific name for a bison is bison bison. Here's what that looks like typed out, bison bison. Up to 60 million bison once grazed the prairie grasses and were food for swift foxes, prairie wolves, eagles, and other animals. I'll include humans in there as well. Almost all the bison were slaughtered by European colonizers in the 1800s, changing the life of the prairie forever. It also says about the elk, which is Cervus elapis, for those of you keeping score at home. Herds of elk grazed the prairies before farming plowed the land. Hunters killed most of the elk, and by 1900, almost all of the elk had disappeared from the prairie. Elk have been reintroduced in Minnesota, but this is still a species of special concern. And then also they mentioned the northern grasshopper mouse. Active at night, this mouse plugs its underground tunnels each morning to keep in moisture and keep out danger. These mice eat grasshoppers, of course, and also other insects, plants, seeds, and even smaller mice. So you can see even a mouse needs to do a lot of work out in the environment to make that spot work for it. So let's read a little bit about the birds, of course. Since we are reading with raptors, you have to read about the bird species. So the black-capped chickadee. These birds love sunflower seeds and can be seen in the fall clinging to the seed heads at the top of the plants, eating the seeds. The burrowing owl. These small owls live in holes in the ground either in empty badger or squirrel burrows, or in holes they dig themselves. If they are frightened, they might make a noise like a rattlesnake. In Minnesota, they are listed as endangered. The Dixisle. The Dixisles migrate north to lay their eggs and raise their young. They build nests on the ground hidden in grasses. Some people think they're <laughs> This one is not one that I have learned to imitate very well. Chi 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 call sounds like saying their name. I think I'm probably doing that one wrong. That might be a good one to look up on allaboutbirds.org if you want to know the sound that dick sizzles make because I don't think I'm imitating it quite right. <laughs> the American goldfinch. These bright yellow birds eat insects and seeds which are found in abundance on the prairie. Goldfinches dig up and down when they, oh, I'm sorry. Goldfinches dip up and down when they fly. They are sometimes called wild canary. You see these American goldfinches here in Minnesota all year round. They're just not quite as bright yellow and during the winter as they are during the summer. The ruby-throated hummingbird, the tiniest birds, hummingbirds sip nectar from tube-shaped flowers such as foxglove beard tongue, bergamot, butterfly weed, wood lilies, and Michigan lilies, all of which grow in prairies. The eastern meadowlark, so this bird, not really a lark, has a beautiful call and builds its nest on the ground. The horned lark, North America's only native lark, can also be seen in prairies. And then, this is one of my personal favorites, the greater prairie chicken. 
In the spring, prairie chickens gather on booming grounds, open areas where the males strut and stamp and make a hollow booming call to attract females. The males leap in the air and inflate orange air sacs in their throats. In Minnesota, prairie chickens are a species of special concern. So this is a prairie chicken. Again, I would highly encourage you to look up prairie chickens on allaboutbirds.org because they have some amazing features that I don't know if you can quite capture in a small illustration, but they have these big kind of orange kind of bulges on their neck that they can inflate and use to make these loud booming calls. It's really fascinating to watch. Some very good videos online. Want to read to the reptiles and amphibians. Again, every time that our uh, northern harrier here is moving around, you can see those big long wings that are perfect for that kind of low soaring flight. So here are the reptiles and amphibians that we'll read about. And then we'll also move on and read about the insects too. So I'll have to, I don't want to cover her up so you can't see quite the whole thing. So the common five-lined skink the five-line skink needs prairies and forests with south-facing rock outcrops so they can bask in the sun and stay warm. They are a species of special concern in Minnesota. The prairie skink is able to break off its tail if grabbed or threatened. The tail wiggles for a few minutes after breaking off. Skink females stay with their eggs and remain with the young for a few days after they hatch to keep them safe. It's pretty, a little bit unusual for reptiles. Plains garter snakes. They give off a really strong smell if they are frightened. These snakes hibernate in burrows or hold with other snakes during the winter. And finally, the Great Plains toad. Prairies are often dry places, so toads that live there lay their eggs in shallow, temporary ponds. In hot, dry weather, the toads burrow underground to wait for rain. Finally, the insects, the bumblebees, many kinds of bees, including carpenter bees, miner bees, leaf cutter bees, and mason bees, carry pollen from flower to flower as they gather nectar for food. On a sunny summer day, an entire prairie can hum with bees. We have a lot of different kinds of bees here in Minnesota, lots of them throughout the world, really important. The Dakota skipper, so these little brown butterflies up here, these small butterflies survive only on native prairie, prairie that has never been completely plowed under or destroyed. Dakota skippers are found in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota, where they are listed as threatened. The Great Spangled Fritillary, the, oh, actually, not that one, that's a monarch. Maybe one of these guys. Not sure which one, maybe it's this one. The Great Spangled Fritillary, they're beautiful brown, orange and brown butterflies, can have up to a four inch wingspan. Adult butterflies feed on many prairie flowers, including milkweed, bergamot, black-eyed Susan, and, and Joe pieweed. The monarch butterfly, maybe one of the most famous butterflies, especially here in Minnesota, they migrate thousands of miles to lay their eggs on milkweed plants. The larvae eat the milkweed leaves, while adults feed on many kinds of flowers, including goldenrods, sunflowers, and asters. The auto skipper butterfly, these small brown butterflies survive only on native prairie that has never been plowed or overgrazed. The larvae make tiny shelters of plant material and silk and emerge only to feed on grasses. They are also listed as threatened in Minnesota. The silvery checker spot butterfly, these small butterflies spend their first winter after the eggs hatch as larvae before making their chrysalises and emerging as adults. Adults eat nectar from prairie plants such as milkweed and fleabane. The soldier beetle is often seen on goldenrod in late summer and fall. These brightly colored beetles eat nectar and many small insects. 
They look like lightless fireflies. The, here's that tiny little uh, soldier beetle. The red-legged grasshopper can fly close to the ground for 30 or 40 feet. Impressive. During a drought when food is scarce, adults can develop longer wings and fly more often and for longer distances in search of food. Can you imagine if there's not a lot of food that can grow longer wings? That is amazing. Finally, the tiger swallowtail. These large yellow butterflies feed on golden alexanders and other flowers. They sometimes puddle in large groups, sipping moisture from damp ground. I really enjoy all of these summaries because they really tell you a lot about what it's like to live in a big open prairie grassland for a lot of these small animals thinking about there not being a ton of water around, there being lots of plants, being kind of dry, kind of not a lot of cover from that big kind of bright sun during the day. This is a lot that these animals have to do all these different things just to survive in those kinds of areas. There are a few more pages about the flowers and grasses. So we'll finish off with these. So the flowers, there's the rough blazing star and uh, where it says many varieties of blazing star dot the prairie with their blooms in late summer and fall. Rough blazing star, dotted blazing star, staley blazing star, and prairie blazing star. They provide food for butterflies, especially for monarchs as they migrate. The bottle gentian is also called closed gentian because its flowers stay tightly shut Bumblebees work hard to get at the pollen inside, using their hind legs to hold the petals open so they can get out again. For butterfly weed, the leaves of this bright orange blossomed plant are food for monarch butterfly larvae and for gray hair streak butterfly larvae. Hummingbirds, swallowtails, and other butterflies eat the flower's nectar. The cup plant the leaves of this plant join together at the stem, forming little cups in which rainwater collects. Birds drink this water and tree frogs sometimes sit in the tiny pools. In the fall, goldfinches dine on the seeds. There's also the silky aster. Many kinds of asters grow in prairies. I'll read off a few. There are the aromatic asters, the New England asters, heath asters, small blue asters, and swamp asters. Silky asters have purple blue flowers. Foxglove beard's tongue. Bees and hummingbirds visit this tall flower with tube shaped blossoms. It blooms in the spring. Here are a few more. I think these ones the book talked about a lot, so I'll just say their names. There's goldenrod, there's hairy mountain mint, there's Joe Pine weed, the pale purple coneflower prairie milkweed, and prairie sunflower, all kind of a couple of uh, illustrations over here. All of these are really important for their seeds are often feeding birds, and their nectar is often feeding a lot of the insects, especially the butterflies and even sometimes hummingbirds. And then here are a few of the big grasses that were mentioned. So here's the big blue stem. This is a common prairie grass. In summer, this tall grass is greenish blue, and in fall, it turns purplish red. Big blue stem is often called turkey's foot because the stems of its seed head looks a lot like a turkey's footprint. And finally, Indian grass. Like blue stem, this grass is found in many kinds of prairies and its seeds are food for finches and sparrows during the winter. So here's a variety of those beautiful native grassland plants. You can see they have tons of variety, all different sizes and shapes, different kinds of flowers and seeds. All of these are really kind of important puzzle pieces for creating a good habitat for a lot of our native wildlife. So this has been Plant a Pocket of Prairie by Phyllis Roots with illustrations by Betsy Bowen. So hopefully some great information there. Actually, let me look and see in the back. I forget if there was a page I will say at the very, very end of the book, it has a couple of suggestions for other things, places where you can see prairies, as well as uh, ways that you can help, which are state parks, 
Here in Minnesota, these are Blue Mounds State Park, Buffalo River State Park, Killinwood State Park, Big Stone Lake State Park, and Glacial Lake State Park. All have some uh, either preserved or restored uh, state park land for prairies. You can also check out the DNR webpage if you want to see native prairie grasslands. I'm sure most states will also have a lot of that. There are also a lot of kind of different scientific and natural areas. You can also look up at the DNR website. Again, if you're here in Minnesota, if you are elsewhere and you want to check out um, potentially local kind of prairie grasslands in your area, your state's Department of Natural Resources page is a great place to start. You can also check out the Nature, Conservac Nature Conservancy, that's how I say the word, Nature Conservancy. Um, they are at nature.org. They usually have lots of great resources for finding your local kind of native prairie grassland areas and what you can do to help them out. So tell us what you can do to help plant your own pocket of prairie or to help visit and preserve the ones that you already have near you. Um, I saw a couple of little questions that came up really quick while we were scrolling. I know it was a little bit of a longer book, but I had so much really cool information. I think the main thing that came up is, um, so they said they weren't aware that we actually had a Northern Harrier that lived with us. Um, yes, yeah, so this is, for those of you who missed it at the beginning, this is our uh, resident northern harrier. So this is a native open grasslands area species. So we oftentimes see them in more rural areas here in the upper Midwest. Um, but you can find them across most of North America. Generally, um, one of my favorite things about harriers, actually, because this is the kind of thing I get very interested in, is that you usually don't have kind of overlapping species of harrier. You kind of have one type of harrier, harrier per kind of big grassland area on each continent. So we have our Northern Harrier here in North America. There's another type of Harrier in South America. There's another type of Harrier in kind of Europe. It's another type of Harrier that kind of lives in kind of the steppes of Asia, kind of north of the Himalayan mountains. Uh, there's one Harrier that lives in Australia. There's one Harrier that lives in kind of the Sahara region of Africa. So you really just have a small number of harrier species that have adapted to living in these big open grassland areas. So we just have the northern harrier is our only North American harrier species, which I think is pretty cool. So they have specially adapted those very long, you can see her wings are enormous for how kind of tiny her actual body is. She has really long wings, a really long tail, perfect for soaring, nice kind of swooping down low over those big open grassy areas. So those big open grasslands are not only important for tiny insects and small birds and small mammals, but they also affect a lot of our larger raptor species as well. So we have northern harriers, barn owls, short-eared owls are all species that you can oftentimes find in big open kind of grassy areas. With all of that, I think those were the only uh, kind of comments or questions for this one. So definitely check that out. I do have a few links I want to drop in the comments of this one this time around for the Nature Conservancy, um, the Minnesota DNR's kind of prairie finder. Um, and then I will drop a link to allaboutbirds.org for a couple of those bird calls because I know those were not the best impressions. And I want you to know and appreciate what these birds actually sound like. So I'll put those in there as well. Otherwise, in the meantime, as always, if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing uh, here online at the Raptor Center, keep following our Facebook page or check us out at theraptorcenter.org. We also have lots of information about the kinds of raptors that live here in the upper Midwest area of North America, along with a lot of other great links to other kind of work that's being done uh, with raptors and conservation can check out what other online programs and things we have going on. And as always in the link to this video, I put a link to our um, kind of sponsorship program. If you're interested in doing some more kind of close up and personal videos with some of the birds here, you can check that link out. It's got a lot of great information. In the meantime, everyone have a great rest of your week. We will see you next week for more Reading with Raptors. Bye everyone.